Hey kids, are you ready to read Miss Osborne the Mop? It's time for chapter six. Are you ready? All right, let's see if we can find out what happens when Miss Osborne the Mop comes back. Miss Osborne was headed for the house. Jody could see it once. In a minute or two, she would be stomping over the porch and banging on the door. And what in the world would happen if Uncle John answered the knock and found himself talking to a live dust mop? On her bare feet, Jody ran silently out of her room and down the stairs. The front door was never locked, and she jerked it open and hoped the rasping squeak it gave wouldn't wake anybody. She opened and shut the screen very carefully because it was apt to bang. Then she flew across the porch and down the steps and along the path. The mop stopped short and looked shocked. I hope you don't customarily run around outside in those, those garments, she said sharply. Jody glanced down at her baby dolls. They had little blue flowers all over them and she thought they were very pretty. Oh, it's quite all right this early in the morning, she said airily. She didn't know what else to say, though she wanted to point out that the mop was running around outside with nothing at all except her brown wooden self. I thought we might go for a walk. It's so pretty outside. It's a beautiful morning, said the mop puffily, but it was certainly not the kind of night I had been led to expect. Uh, didn't you hear the fly-by-nights? asked Jody innocently. Oh, yes, they sang divinely, answered the mop, clasping her thin little hands under her non-existent chin. Then her voice grew indignant. It was later, after they stopped singing, that things grew so unpleasant that that place was hardly more than a burrow, and the bed was very hard. And it was right down on the ground and most difficult to get in and out of, and no facilities, no hot water or soap. Things running around all night quite near. One of them ran right over my bed. Oh, she shuddered delicately. Uh, well, exclaimed Jody, you were camping out. Um, I guess that's the way it is when you're camping out. The mop drew herself up. I did not understand that I was camping out, as you say. I understood that I was staying in accommodations provided for visitors who wished to enjoy the outdoors at night. It was uncomfortable and unsuitable for a lone female, and I refuse to stay there any longer. I shall ask your aunt to find more suitable lodgings for me. And she started towards the house. Oh, no, no wait, cried Jody. Uh, aunt Margaret's still in bed. She wants to be thoroughly rested when the company gets here. Um, why don't you go back around the bend there where that little stone bench is and sit down? There is a beautiful view of the ravine and the rhododendron there. Um, I'll go get Dill. He knows where everything is around here. Um, he'll find a really nice place for you to stay and we'll take you there ourselves. The mop looked unconvinced, but she allowed Jody to lead her to the bench. It was very low, but the mop still had to struggle to bend in the right places to sit on it. No wonder she had such a hard time in the cave thought Jody, who knew that Dill's bed was nothing more than a couple of quilts laid on the ground. Miss Osborne, the mop, was certainly a curious sight when she sat. Jody hoped nobody would come along the path and find her perched there. She'd give anybody the screamy memes. The sun had risen in the sky now, though the shadows were still long and the air still chilly. What a really beautiful place this is, Jody thought, and she trusted that the mop was enjoying the towering trees, the blossoming glossy-leaved shrubs, and the awesome big gray rocks furred with lichen and moss and ferns. When Jody got back to the house, she could hear Aunt Margaret and Uncle John in the kitchen. She tiptoed up the stairs and into Dill's room. He was asleep on the top bunk bed, and she had to stand on the edge of the bottom bunk to shake him. It was hard. Waking Dill was never easy. Let me alone, he growled, pulling a pillow over his face. Dill, wake up, whispered Jody fiercely. One of her feet was getting a cramp in it from being curled over the sharp edge of the bed. She grabbed Dill's arm and pinched hard. Ouch, 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 she muttered. Go away and let me alone. Dill, she cried desperately and twisted her hand in his hair and pulled. 
She couldn't pull very much because his hair was so short, but it worked. For Pete's sake, he hollered, sitting up and throwing his pillow across the room. You're scalping me. Hush, hush, warned Jody. Oh, Dill, do be quiet. Get up. We have to do something about the mop. She didn't like the cave, and now she's sitting, coming to complain to Aunt Margaret if we don't find her a better place to stay. Get me up in the middle of the night and pull all my hair out, grumbled Dill. Who's the mop? What's the... Oh, the mop. Jody, good grief. Oh, don't let Mother see her. Run quick and stop her. He jumped to the floor and looked wildly around. I have stopped her, said Jody. She's sitting out on the bench, but she isn't going to be willing to sit there long. She's peeved as a wet hen. We've got to think of something to do with her. Uh, take her up the mountain and put her off a cliff, said Dill callously. Oh, Dill, I wish you wouldn't talk that way, wailed Jody. Well, pushing her off a cliff might be kinder than tying her to a tree and leaving her, answered Dill. And Jody, you know we can't just leave her to run around the house. And to run around loose. Jody stared at him. Oh, what are we going to do? She asked miserably. Don't worry, he told her. I'll think of something. I'm pretty good at getting out of tight scrapes. Mm. You go get dressed and wear some blue jeans. Jody dressed hurriedly. She peered into the dim little damp spot of mirror and slapped at her hair with a brush. The glasses had had to be left at Wolftown and wouldn't be back for several days. And that's the only good thing that's happened lately, Jody thought. It was nice to have those heavy old black rims squatting on her nose. Downstairs, Dill was almost dressed and eating his cantaloupe. Mother's putting us up some sandwiches, he informed Jody. I told her uh, we were going up the mountains and probably would be gone most of the day. She was glad. She's getting ready for her company. Jody nodded. She ate so fast she could feel large, unchewed lumps of cantaloupe under her ribs for half an hour afterwards. But she knew Aunt Margaret would fuss if they didn't eat, and Jody could practically hear the mop growing more and more impatient out on that bench. Dill finished first. I'll get the sandwiches, said, he said. You go sit with the, you know. Jody gulped the rest of her milk and took half of her plate of toast with her. The mop was sitting just as Jody had left her. She looked relaxed and contented, and Jody was relieved. Suddenly, it occurred to her that perhaps a night's sleep had restored her powers. Silently, she crept up behind the mop. From the back. Except for her little stick arms and legs, it was hard to tell that the mop wasn't an ordinary dust mop. So it ought to be easy, Jody told herself. Nevertheless, she concentrated with all of her muscles. Be a mop, she breathed softly. For just an instant, she thought it had worked, and then the mop's head whirled around. It's very bad manners to sneak up on people, she snapped. Oh, oh, cried Jody, a little startled herself. Uh, I, I didn't mean to sneak. It's the path being so thick with pine needles and, and I'm wearing tennis shoes. She held up her foot for the mop to see. And just then, Dill came pounding down the path. He was carrying a very bulky knapsack. What a lot of lunch, thought Jody. Good morning, Miss Mop, he said gaily. Goodness, thought Jody, I've never known Dill to be so polite to anybody. He's practically bowing and scraping and kissing her hand. I'm sorry you didn't, you, to hear you didn't have a restful night, he went on in a horrible mincing voice. Though I might say I couldn't tell from looking at you, you look as fresh as a daisy. The mop was not to be soothed. You needn't be so innocent, young man, she scolded. That was an unkind trick to persuade me to stay in that unpleasant place with all those creatures. I might have been gnawed on. And she shivered convulsively. Dill's awful politeness vanished. Gosh, they're just deer mice, he explained hotly. They eat nuts and seeds and things. They don't gnaw on on people. Oh, and I don't think it's such an unpleasant place. I spent lots of nights there. And Uncle Andrew sleeps there every time he comes to visit. And even Daddy sleeps there. The mop looked at him pensively. Well, I don't suppose you meant any harm, she said, sounding less irritated. Perhaps you didn't realize that a spot suitable for vigorous men was not quite the place for a delicate female. So rough and primitive, 
most uncomfortable. I'm sorry, said Dill. And he really did sound contrite. I guess I'm just used to it. And I suppose it is helpful, mused the mop. The fresh mountain air and the brisk temperature. Oh, yes, cried Jody. People are always saying how helpful the mountain air is. It's very good for you to sleep in the open. I'm sure it is. Hmm. I wish we'd taken you further up the mountain, Dill put in hastily. The air up there is just full of health and minerals and things. Um, and there are lots of nice places to stay. To stay? asked the mop. Not to camp out? Oh, well, said Dill a little uncertainly. Um, it isn't fancy, but it isn't a cave. Oh, I don't object to things being plain, exclaimed the mop. It's just that I'm not really very strong, she said faintly, putting one hand up to her stringy head. I just really cannot stand up to a very strenuous existence, but I would like to have a pleasant place to stay in the mountains for a few days. It's so beautiful. There's so much of interest to see in flora and fauna and all, and I'm sure it would be good for my health. Well, I was thinking about sort of a mountain cabin, said Dill, Dill vaguely. Just the thing, cried the mop. Do, let's start. Jody shot Dill an apprehensive glance. Did he truly expect to leave the mop in that old shack he and Bill Rubin had built last year? She'd have a fit when she saw it, Jody told herself darkly. The cave was better. At least it didn't leak buckets when it rained. We can take this path by the creek and then on up the mountain, said Dill, looking relieved. It's a good day for walking. Yes, indeed, murmured the mop. A beautiful day. And how lovely the old rhododendron is. That pale pink is particularly handsome. I want to get a closer look. She scurried along the path and her ridiculous little legs switched back and forth under her tall, skinny body like, like, well, Jody couldn't think like what, but she couldn't watch long without having to turn her head aside and press her hand to her face to keep from laughing. Are you really going to take her to the shack? She whispered to Dill. He nodded. She'll have a real duck fit, prophesied Jody. Well, she'll just have to have it, said Dill. Nobody can hear her talking on up there, up there. And, and can you think of anything else to do with her? I thought we could fix up the roof with some branches and bark. It isn't going to rain anytime soon anyway. I brought a blanket in the knapsack and there's an old cot still in there. We'll fix the place up for her as good as we can today, and tomorrow we can bring up a camp stool and a few things. If it's cleaned up, it, it shouldn't be too bad, he sighed. <sighs> we can keep her up here this summer, but come fall, I don't know what we'll do. For a while, they walked in melancholy silence, faced with the prospect of spending the rest of their lives caring for the mop and hiding her from the eyes of the world. Oh dear, oh dear, wailed Jody to herself. It's all Dill's fault. I shouldn't have listened to him. It's all your fault, said Dill bitterly. You never should have listened to me. There's a robin, cried the mop, pointing at the big rusty breasted bird scratching in the path before them. Do come along, you two. You miss everything poking along like that. It was a not my fault, Jody began, but Dill wasn't listening. If she isn't strong, I'm a cham chimpanzee's cousin, he said crossly and heard, hurried to catch up with the mop as she hopped up the winding trail. Jody still lagged behind. Maybe she would be way down the mountain when the mop got her first look at her cabin and had her fit. Well, it was a lovely day and that was the only consolation Jody could think of. The sun was bright and the air was cool, and though they had left the creek behind, they could still occasionally hear it talking and murmuring off in the distance. They climbed steadily, and as they went higher, the path became rougher and less well marked. Once in a while, they got a glimpse of the surrounding peaks, blue and lavender and shadowed as they rose against the sky. The tops of the tallest mountains were swathed in mist, as though they were wearing white silk turbans. 
The mop had left the path to observe an azalea bush. Dale stood waiting for her, and now Jody caught up with him. She had just opened her mouth to resume the argument about whose fault it was when he suddenly seized her arm. Listen, he said, somebody's coming. There was a noise almost beside them in the underbrush. Somebody shouted out roughly, and then there was the deafening roar of a shot. Oh, we're to chapter seven. Oh, I hope you enjoyed chapter six. We'll have to find out what happened with the shot. See you next time.